I guess I just had to get settled in. Hi, everybody. Hello. <laughs> so uh, up in the upper right-hand corner of Zoom, there's something called Gallery View. And if you click on that, it should make three nice windows uh, that are bigger. Yeah. You and see the three windows up at the top. Yeah, okay. And so when you uh, try using the speaker view and the gallery view, it, uh, it just makes it a little bit bigger. So you can rotate through those different views till you find the one you want. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so good. You, you all know Michael? Yes. Well, Two out of three. Two out of three. Okay. Never, I have never met either one of you, so now I see both of you. Oh, Boris okay. and Rob. Great. So, uh, and the lovely lady. This is Elisa, my wife. Elisa. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Pleasure. Hi, okay. Lisa. So, you talk, you've talked a little bit about flypaper amongst you? Well, a little bit, but, you know, if you wouldn't mind... Let's let Boris give you a little bit of his background. Okay. And then maybe you could give us the Reader's Digest version uh, sure. that we went over uh, two days ago, I guess. Okay. That's okay, great. so so my name is Boris Moreau. I'm, my background is in education and in linguistics. Mm -hmm. I came to know Tom and Lisa about 10 years ago uh, when I was a principal at a middle school here in Phoenix. Um, and... Uh, I have worked the last eight years for Rosetta Stone, primarily as a subject matter expert. Mm -hmm. um, so my responsibility was in developing professional development and also developing language management systems for school districts and for universities. Awesome. And so I have a background in linguistics and languages and education, and also uh, some, I've been dabbling a little bit in marketing. So uh, my job now is to help Thomas Charles editions with uh, their marketing attempts and to really get our name out there so that we can sell more and become more known. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so uh, hopefully you did not meet them in a remedial program at the elementary school. <laughs> <laughs> On the soccer field. <laughs> we, we don't okay. call it remedial anymore. We call it special ed. Oh, there you go. Okay. I, I'm sorry. That that was just a soft lob. I had to go there. Um, okay. IEPs and individualized educational programs. Okay, very good. So, um, okay, and so Boris, would you say that your SEO, SEM, social skills are uh, up there at an intermediate level, or uh, I, I would you... say, yeah, I'm comfortable saying that. Yes. Okay. All right. So that's that's the level that I'll address this conversation. Okay. So, um, um, my background, which uh, uh, we went through a couple of days ago, I'll just give you a quick recap of it. Uh, yeah, October 10th this year will be my 40th, 40th year of doing high technology. I opened up uh, computer stores back in 1976. And You're not so, that old. <laughs> I'll be 64 in October. Very good. Yeah, thank my mom. <laughs> yeah thanks ma here's to you <laughs> so uh yeah so i was just a i was a little piker i got out of the air force i knew electronics because of the air force and uh so i applied all that electronics uh, experience to the civilian world and and figured what i really needed to do is sell boats because that's where the bikinis were very good so i sold boats and then uh, I had an idea because I didn't know really anything about computers and electronics, and that was to um, be able to communicate with all the people on the 60 plus lakes in the air, in the area. The Irish Hills of Michigan was a glacier melt area, so there's lots of lakes and lots of lakefront. But advertising was expensive, and I just wanted to be able to reach out to every fifth house and do a mailer, and so. Stamps were expensive, and so that's what I wanted to do, every fifth house. And then next mailer I did would be to the second of the fifth set. And the next mailer would be to the third one. And the mailers all said, hey, um, if you got all the fire extinguishers and life preservers and motor parts that you need, propellers, then pass this on to your neighbor. Well, that worked out pretty good. They, because they did share that brochure, 
And all of a sudden, it was really great being in the boat business. And, um, and that was because I soldered up a computer and made the computer do it. And once I did that, I said, hey, I don't think this is ever going to go away anytime soon. And pretty soon, uh, it was to go ahead and start selling assembled uh, computers because the only way I could get them was as kits. So I started a, a Henry Ford kind of assembly line and started really building computers to compete with digital equipment, uh, you know, the deck PDP sixes and eights and all of that old hardware stuff. Anyway, moving along, I uh, have done a lot in software uh, and did a lot of programming over the years and made national software packages that crushed the competition. Uh, had some big uh, staffs from uh, 16, 18 people up to 59 people and have retired eight times now uh, for sometimes <laughs> <laughs> until I get bored. But when I take the time off, I think. And uh, last time was sailing in the Atlantic for three years and thought a lot. And, uh, and it was all about marketing and how somebody could really dominate this thing called the Internet. And so been developing solutions and the best one now, the, the creme de la creme is flypaper. Now we all know what flypaper is. It's that sticky thing that you put down wherever you want the, or expect the flies to land. So <clears throat> uh, we're all aware of what retargeting is, right? Which was, what's the term retargeting? Retargeting, okay. right. So let's say um, you go look at a watch, mm -hmm. okay? And now for the next two weeks, that watch is being pushed in your face wherever you go, mm -hmm. okay? The, the fact that that shows up everywhere and only for you, that's retargeting. Mm -hmm. the breakthrough with what I've done here is that, um, that I am able to do it for a specific person for a specific reason because let's say you had one of the competitors to your artist and that artist was going to, um, uh, you know, a person would decide either to go with your uh, artist or some other artist. Well, if there is a YouTube video on the internet about the other artist, I can put flypaper on that YouTube video. And even though they land there, never play the video or anything, just the very fact that they get on that page, mm -hmm. I own them they are stuck in my flypaper, okay? If uh, somebody writes an article about the best Russian painters in the world, okay, I can flypaper that article because uh, that I can go to that particular page exactly and only that page, and then I do a segmented list of people, of everybody that land on that other YouTube video or a different list of people for the people that land on the... New York Times article, and if the Huffington Post has got something, or ABC, or NBC, or CBS, or CNN, or Fox, or somebody runs something, or, or in Britain, or in the U.S., or in Russia, it really doesn't matter. I own them. So you're able to, through this flypaper technology, identify who's landed on what websites, and then try to kind of draw conclusions about common websites and who might be interested in a specific topic or subject area. You're close. Okay. So here's where the real competitive advantage comes in. So if I, um, if I know that I'm targeting people that are probably shopping. Okay. So like if I, if I would fly paper a site where there was a review of the best five best aviation watches. Okay or aviation sunglasses. They're going there to read that review because they're probably gonna buy something pretty quickly. Why, why else would they review something? So what I do is make the assumption that they're in the market. It, there would be no reason for them to read that article about the best Russian artists, okay? It, versus the general population. So there's another visual kind of uh, comparison. If I take um, a, a piece of paper and I put it up, uh, up on a billboard and I make it 40 feet wide and I put it on the freeway, everybody going on the freeway is going to see that. Well, that's the way the usual advertising is on the internet. Okay, 
But if I now take that same piece of paper and I make it this size and I put it under the windshield wiper of a per particular person's car and every time they move their car, I keep on putting <laughs> the, the flyer under their windshield for the next two months instead of them whipping past that billboard, it's a completely different effect, right? Yeah, I could see the guy being annoyed by that paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden, I have a stalker with a 12-gauge on me. <laughs> Waiting for you to put it on there the next time. <laughs> right. So, but luckily, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit safer in the digital world. Mm -hmm. So, people are expecting retargeting. They're seeing it. And a lot of people appreciate it because it's like, yeah, I can't even remember the site that I went on that had those cool aviator glasses. In your case, I, I, uh, what was the name of that gallery that I saw that great Russian artist? Well, they don't have to look at it at all. You keep on pushing. It's your, your puppy dog. You ever walk a puppy dog? Puppy dog is on a leash. They're always tugging in front of you. Mm -hmm. So it's the same kind of thing. It, that person's always going to be walking that puppy dog for weeks. Now, this retargeting uh, that you're speaking of, the, using the flypaper technology to identify these people who you want to retarget, um, is this similar to a computer catching via the cookie process, someone who might be looking at engagement rings and then looking at them at Jared's, let's say, and therefore every time they go on a specific website, they'll kind of see the Jared ad off right. to the side? Yeah, no, uh, it kind of. A cookie uh, works to identify the person when they come back to the same site. Okay. Okay, so this is a lot more... Uh, well, let's see. We could call it NSA-ish, or we could call it insidious, or we could call it the most fantastic marketing opportunity on the planet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but probably all three of them are accurate. So, um, no, with a cookie, you're keeping track of what's going on uh, when they return to your site. You can then address them by their first name or something if they gave you their first name and email address or whatever. You're also keeping track that they're returning and that would be something that would be built onto the new site anyway. So um, you want to know when people return. And the reason you want to know when they return is so that you can get rid of them if they don't stay on your site very long. So part of the other technology that I've got under Flypaper, which actually, Flypaper was way more difficult. The earlier technology is if somebody comes back to a site, I, I essentially start a stopwatch. And if they're on the site for... Um, 10 seconds and they leave, they're probably tire kickers, right? They're probably not very serious about anything. So why keep on wasting money advertising to them? You're far better off dealing with somebody who stays on the site for 30 seconds or a minute or three minutes, whatever you want that threshold to be, and then only presenting the advertising to them because they spent time on the site. So that's where you do use a cookie. And so uh, this, is, this is cookie on steroids. Okay. Okay. So Robert, Robert just, um, tell them about, they don't actually need to click on anything on the page where the fly paper is. The moment they land there, they're captured. So you're getting 100% of the people that, <laughs> right. Okay. So, yeah, um, the, the, the major breakthrough here was that um, the only way retargeting happens in the internet right now, other than through the flypaper technique, is that somebody goes to the site and they uh, click on an ad. And at that point, because of the action of that click, they are now discovered. Okay, the beauty of this uh, is that two nanoseconds, maybe three, in the worst case, four nanoseconds, after they land on the page, I have them. So it means that 100% of the time that uh, I know their anonymous Google identity and their anonymous Facebook identity. So when they go to their Facebook 
uh, page and, and they're checking out their friends and their relatives, it's going to show up in their Facebook feed on the side. Okay. Whenever uh, they go to any of the sites that they go to that Google is monetizing through AdWords, your ad is going to show up in front of them, the puppy dog tugging on the leash. So that's how once you identify somebody that is in the market first, uh, because they landed on a page for two or three or four nanoseconds, and now they're just hopelessly stuck on the flypaper, then that's when uh, we are able to turn that right around and show them Puppy on a Leash on their Facebook feed and everywhere they go in the internet. Is this making sense? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of crazy. It's really NSA stuff, isn't it? <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and you actually know how long they stay on that page, correct? So you yeah. said that you could eliminate people who land for 10 seconds and then go away, whereas as opposed to people who land for two minutes and perhaps take the time to read deeper. Right, yeah. And almost all, see, because I come from the world of entrepreneurism, I've had 37 businesses. And they were all startups, okay? And some were spectacular and let me retire for long periods of time, six, eight years at a time. And some were dismal failures. And a lot of them were kind of in the middle. But when you do a lot of consulting uh, for big companies, for GM, NASA, which I've done, uh, you realize just how totally wasteful they are. They have so much money that they, <laughs> because they have so much, they blow so much. So in entrepreneurial startups, which I love, it's like, okay, so how can we get from A to Z and spend the least amount of money and be really smart about that path? And I help my clients to figure that out, not just as a programmer, but as a kind of a business consultant. It's like, yeah, I've seen a lot, a lot of companies have made my own mistakes. And so now it's like, okay, that's where we're at. Don't do that. Do this instead. I have a quick question. Sure. How, how do you determine the, not only demographics, but the financial capacity? Because in the art business and our price points, you know, it's different than like on Facebook, I get things about dresses that are about 20 bucks, which mm -hmm. I would buy. So how does one determine that you're actually deriving that client at that price point that we have? Okay, that's a really good and smart question. Okay, and I know you're too young for this, but when I was a kid, uh, there was this little tin can that looked like one of the, the charcoal starters, and you put flour on the top, and you squeezed this handle until your hand went numb, and you sifted the flour out. Sifters. Oh, oh. See, you are too young for that. Okay. I don't know what an ironing board is, okay? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> There's a flour or kind of a fluffy texture to it. Right. So my grandmother was Italian, and that's all I would do for, for the pizza and the bread. Boy, my, I've got a grip like like an Iron Man because of it to this day. But um, so being able to sift those anonymous ones is possible. When you sift them by certain things like, you know, did they also visit a Lexus dealer? Right. Did they, did they visit a Mercedes dealer? Do, do they live in a zip code where the average home is 300,000 up? Okay. So there's ways to, knock out uh, the uh, ones that you're finding that are looky loose that can't afford it. So the, uh, the advertising dollar can go much further. Mm -hmm. Now this happens to work in the U S but it will work just fine in, in Japan and China and India. And uh, all of those same metrics are available, Germany and France. So if they're subscribing to Burberry, for instance, in mm -hmm. Louis Vuitton, those demographics could be captured? Uh, kind of the opposite, okay? Once I, once I have enough of a sample that came to the flypaper, then I can uh, delete from the flies that are stuck in the flypaper unless they meet certain parameters. So I know I have a bunch of flies on there, but now all I want is the prime 50 flies out of the 400 that are there. 
Mm -hmm. And that way our advertising dollar is going to go way farther. Gotcha. Okay. Right? Yeah. yeah. So there, that's why the, this is so exciting. When this happened, I came out of my skin and I wrote uh, an email to, to my to my customers and I said, I'm done you are my last customers. I will only partner now with people. Uh, so uh, consider yourself lucky because I'm cutting off. Don't even recommend people to me unless they're willing to partner. And, and so it was like, okay, wow, I guess I'm not going to be eating ramen noodles in the last years of my life. <laughs> we hope not. And we don't want to either. Yeah, no, you're not going to. <laughs> I mean, do you realize how fast these countries can be opened up? the efficiency of how fast this could happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just crazy. And now, with, you know, I've been doing NLP for 30 years. So uh, I know the power of how you take uh, and build a logical argument with, with uh, anchors and, and mind candy. And so, uh, you know, if that's not on my plate, which it usually is, is to craft those emails and stuff. Um, we just come up with a nice logical, uh, ethical bribe. Once they come to the uh, site, when they click on the gallery uh, uh, ad, they come to the site, we stop them on entrance to the site, and we go, we're going to give you this tremendous report of why these six Russian artists have their ranking and, and the history of the value of their paintings over the last 10 years. Okay, so they're gonna get a PDF, but we're getting their name, address, and potentially their phone number. Now, the next phase, I, I know how to get there. It just is gonna cost me money to, to, to correlate this. I'll be able to, after taking your concept of how do you wean out only those that are driving luxury cars or live in luxury uh, zip codes. Once we have those people, I can pay uh, to correlate those anonymous uh, identities with their real identities. And I know how to get there. It's just it's going to cost me probably eighty or $90,000 to do it. How do you perceive consummating the sale though. So you've captured the interest, mm -hmm. which is key. And how do you close when they physically do, don't see something? How do you romance that point? Well, there's a couple of ways. And when we were talking a couple of days ago, um, on uh, the shopping cart that I put together, the shopping cart would have its own iPad. So let's say you have some you know, uh, entrepreneurial gallery type owner in Japan that's doing something in the mall and they're getting the hot sake flowing and they got everybody drunked up and they're walking around with their iPad and they're going, oh, you buy now. <laughs> I like that. So, Hit the yeah. button. <laughs> you buy now. That's it. Yeah. Put it in your cart. <laughs> right. And uh, so, and it, just being able to put a little, uh, uh, you know, square or whatever into the iPad and you just do the transaction right there. So one of the other things that we're talking about is not having the really, really high resolution photos that can be downloaded. So I would put that in a secure server location where um, the software could access it and a magnifying glass could enlarge just a small portion of it. And so they could really see brush strokes and right down to the nitty gritty, but they would not be able to take this 10 megabyte high resolution photograph and go over to their own printer plotter and print it out at Kinko's, you know, for some people that's going to be good enough, you know, because if they got a hold of the high resolution picture, then they could just go to a printer plotter and do it on plain paper uh, instead of like a nice Epson or a nice Canon printer, they'll do it on canvas or they might find somebody that has one that can do it. As long as they had the high resolution image, they could do it. So we want to be able to avoid that. I was going to get into this business, uh, but the gallery owner died. He liked his cocaine too much. 
<laughs> Meet my little friend, this little vial. Yeah, I killed him. But Lisa, once somebody lands on the site, they're going to see the images and the artists that you have for sale in the same way normally. Yeah. So you're getting them, you're relying on them. I mean, you've got to show them something that they're going to be interested in. So you might have you know, an example picture for each of the artists and then they click on that and it just expands the gallery. And now you're looking at, you know, nine or 10 pictures that are available and then that with the information about the picture below it, and then they can click on it to enlarge it and zoom in. And then they just have an option, you know, a buy button. Well, and on top of that, so uh, yesterday, uh, I had uh, a contingent from Tibet. Uh, and I'm uh, there, they have this organization called Tadra. And Tadra started out in Switzerland and then Germany. And now they, uh, they take these kids from uh, the steps of, of uh, the, the highlands at 12,000 feet in Tibet that are orphans. The mother died in childbirth. The father turned into a drunk. The kids are abandoned. And so they've taken these kids over the last 10 years and they've turned them into scholars. And in Tibet and in China, if you're an orphan, you're completely stigmatized. It's nothing, it's bad here in the U.S. And there, you're, you're like an outcast. It's just bad, bad news. And it's there, they win all the awards. They're number one in the whole country. And so they were here, and I was just filming them with a four-camera shoot. Um, and so you're in Phoenix. I'm in uh, Las Vegas. I can come into Phoenix and, and actually do a three- or four-camera shoot of you talking about the... Uh, uh, the artist, the artist, I understand, lives in Phoenix, so we can get him on camera and do some really high-end uh, work where he can eyeball the customer directly and talk about his life or talk about his art or whatever. And, of course, you can talk about the art and, and the value. And so all of a sudden, you've automated the sales process in a completely different way. And I do all that editing, and I do some pretty fine work if I do say so myself and have for all those businesses all the years I've I've written the copy and I've done the video training stuff and and the marketing uh, videos and all of that so uh, I on my signature block of my email I call myself an expert generalist and full-time catalyst I saw that. yeah so uh, it, it, it just resonated with me one morning at 4 a.m. and ended up on my card. So how do you, uh, what's the first step in this process? Or, or let me ask you another question first. Is there anyone that you're dealing with? I think you said you wanted to max out at 12 businesses that you're working with on this basis. Mm -hmm and you're up to either seven or eight right now. Right. Are there any other companies, not necessarily in the art business, but in the, you know, trying to access uh, the retail buyer for their product mm -hmm. that, that you can say is anywhere similar to what we need to do? Yeah, right now uh, it's uh, the, the store part is done. Uh, I'm partnered up with uh, a company that is a 30 year old company that's been selling uh, designer rugs, hmm. throw rugs. And so uh, the same technique that I'm using, uh, and I was just on the phone with them, just literally is why I hadn't sent that uh, uh, invitation out into the last second because we were going long on it because they want to go live tomorrow. Um, and so they had a situation that's similar to yours. Uh, they had a domestic uh, dealer network, and they were very concerned about, even though the retailers weren't selling a lot, they were concerned about the uh, appearance of going into competition with them. Now, you've got the same issue, but because we're selling into new countries, it shouldn't be too much of an issue for you. Okay. So, um, so, uh, I got new domain names for them. I researched the heck out of the domain names that are necessary uh, to pull it off. I got two excellent ones. Uh, one was too close to a company 
that uses it sporadically, but they're a big company that has got deep pockets and that might have been a trademark thing. So there's an excellent trademark guy in Albuquerque and ran it past them and he said, nah, it's too close. And that that uh, URL was um, your perfect rug and what they own is the perfect rug. Mm-hmm. And so he says, it's just a little bit too close. Yeah. And so he recommended not going. And so the other one that I researched and was able to get was rug perfection. And so in the next couple of days, that's going to be going up. Um, and, uh, and that is uh, all broken. In your case, it would be broken down by artist, okay, or broken down by style or broken down by landscape or uh, uh, portraiture or whatever. So all the categories and everything will be, uh, you just click and, and instantly your page will fill up with those things that a person is interested in. I want portraiture, I want landscape, I want winter scenes, I want whatever. I want only this artist or only that artist. And so it'll do all of that. Um, and then uh, being able to uh, conduct the transaction through a tablet. Uh, and in your case, I, if that's a big uh, issue, I would use a different piece of software uh, in your case, but it would have the same kind of abilities and um, it's just a little bit more robust if you want to uh, make somebody be mm, – I'm thinking that what's going to work here really good, you guys, is um, mini dealers where they're not really gallery people, but they're hustlers. In India, there's a lot of hustlers. In China, there's a lot of hustlers. In Japan, there's not as many hustlers, but they, uh, uh, you know, they, they get out and they do things. So in China, everybody wants their own business. So how do you put them into business? You can put them into business if you're, software allows you to do that and now as they sell them um, either remotely by giving somebody a link they they'll be given a special link and that special link will automatically let them be compensated at the point of purchase so uh, that distribution would happen you've got a three thousand dollar print and they sell it for three thousand and they're going to get five hundred dollars right then and there Hmm. okay and then you're instantly getting uh 200 uh 2500 you know or if there's it it can have multi multi tiers of distribution so that all of that bookkeeping is all automatic so is is the acquisition like on paypal or like how how does one Mm -mm. capture the funds yeah through a merchant account um and uh my preference uh lately is stripe because they have the uh, uh global reach and they are um, they're very, um, they're very computer literate over there. Bank so of the America. And, and the currency is transferred. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. They, they've got a worldwide reach and, and it's all good. Yeah. So, um, and some of them, some of the merchant accounts, they hold your funds for a long time, you know, before they actually release them, especially on the internet. Stripe doesn't play any of those games. They'll do a chargeback on you. If, if somebody contests it or whatever, but that's to be expected. That's going to happen in any situation. So you, you get the acquisition, they purchase it, they pay the funds. We ship it from our location, obviously. Uh-huh. The software prints out all the shipping labels and figures out the uh, shipping cost. Okay. And most of this uh, software already exists. Well, uh, there's big modules that exist, and some of it has to be glued together. Uh, there's something uh, called interoperability. And so when once I have a better understanding of what you're trying to do, then I'll pick the right chunks that can be used for this, and then there, there may be some stuff that needs to be bridged between the really best shopping cart to work with the really best uh, other pieces. Uh, so we just got to dig into that a little bit more. That'd be something that I'd probably just come out to Phoenix and sit down with you for a day, day and a half or something and really uh, play that all out. 
you know, and the overall strategy of is uh, Japan first? Is it India first? You know, last time I was in India was to film all the temples in 360 degrees. And it was 10 cities of 100 million people. 10 cities alone of 100 million, not counting the people in between the cities, right? So, uh, <laughs> and, and we only have 330 million in the U.S. They got 10 cities of 100, 100 million. So it's huge. And there's a lot of money there too. And they speak English. They have 54 dialects, and, but the unifying language is English. Hmm. But of course, that wouldn't help Tom and Lisa because they don't speak English. Boy. Not uh, proper English. <laughs> not proper English. <laughs> Spoken like a true Brit over there. <laughs> I lived in England and New Zealand for a long time. Oh, oh, oh did oh? You just hit his hat, but I, well, I lived in Wellington for three years. Oh yeah. <laughs> when I explained flypaper uh, the first time, uh, the question was, "Well, what are you going to do with all your money?" And I said, "What did I say?" You said, said you're going to buy a property in New Zealand. No, I said I was going to buy New Zealand. Oh, well, you probably could. There's only 79 sheep and 3 million people. It's I ran, I ran out of clients. Yeah. Well, and look, I'm, I'll be 64 in October and uh, I'm going to do this uh, for a long time, but all I need is an internet connection. And so I can be anywhere, you know, I, I would, I would uh, get to port uh, on the boat and, and uh, get an internet connection and I sit there on my deck and I was making these magic keys and shipping them all over the world to professional magicians. It's what financed my three years out in the ocean. <laughs> they call New Zealand God's own because God is the only person that can afford to live there because oh. <laughs> the Maori's own most of the land. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, you know, it's, uh, it's a great place. I mean, I could, I could see, you know, being French Polynesia or somewhere, you know, Tahiti or whatever. But yeah, you know, the U.S. is great, but it's I've no, traveled. Yeah. I've traveled a lot, and as long as I've got a good internet connection, uh, uh, I'm a happy camper. Well, you got any questions? Well, I, I have a couple of questions, um, and maybe you don't have the specifics at this point, Robert, but. When these types of transactions are done, and they're obviously on an international basis, mm -hmm. does the software handle, I mean, you can't put a $5 value on a sale that's $30,000. How are these things done in terms of customs and meeting the requirements of customs? Does the software handle all of that also? Well, the answer to that is I don't know. Mm. Okay. Uh, but I did ask uh, Michael about... Uh, uh, tariffs and or whatever and i was told that there aren't real duty uh issues uh, internationally is that right did i understand that right michael well that's what it used to be that uh, art was almost tax exempt pretty much anywhere in the world now i don't know whether it still is and whether that applies to limited editions it was certainly applied to original art but i'm going back a long time well, the, the, the safest way to to deal with that is to not try to be the expert on all countries because there are some countries that do impose tariffs, duties, whatever. And um, typically the people that we deal with already know that themselves mm -hmm. because we're not the first guy on the block they bought from. Right. So, you know, and every, every time we try to know uh, about a specific country, it turns out that we probably didn't know as much as we needed. Like both right. in Morocco. Well, what happened with us in Morocco? Yeah. We can give you a very simple example where we shipped some original paintings of one of our artists to Morocco. Mm -hmm. And it held up in customs for five months. And when we got it eventually back, it was damaged. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, maybe you, well, there, there's companies that specialize this like BDO. Okay. BDO, uh, is specializes on getting any product to any country. So it might be, 
you pay BDO for a consultation and you, you say, look, I'm considering these six or seven countries first. Tell me which two I need to avoid like death. Yeah. I, I honestly, I, I just don't have enough experience with that. I've, I've done manufacturing in Shenzhen. I've done some other stuff in India, uh, but I, I just don't know that you're in an area that is uh, totally specialized expertise. So, well, right. to do that, if, you're, if, you're ship, Tom, if you're shipping to another country, um, you can just use a, a shipper and they'll, they'll contact the client to clear it through customs. So it's not your responsibility. As long as they've paid the, the freight, the customer pays for the art and the freight, and you send all the documentation, at that point, it's no longer your, your problem, it's theirs. Right, and, and there's customs brokers on the other end that handle all that. Correct. And if, if, if there's enough margin in it, uh, you know, a company like BDO, well, it, all you need is one contact in one country to handle the whole country. So... Uh, if you've got a customs clearing house and you've got an agent there, they're just your, they're your person. Yeah. When we use something like DHL, mm -hmm. they, they always know who the custom brokers are. Mm -hmm. and we basically don't have to take a role in that at all. Mm -hmm. I have a complicated question because we did have a situation. He's not an obstetrician. <laughs> <laughs> Copyright. Although I have pretended to be in some <laughs> bars. <laughs> TMI. How that work out for you? <laughs> I, still, I still have the dent on this side of my face. Okay. Can I tell my complicated? Please do. That's not how complicated. <laughs> Oh, I can't laugh anymore. Anyways, a copyright situation. Um, we have had situations in past years that um, we have a lot of Chinese companies copying our artists, taking them off our website. Yeah, I discussed that. Oh, you did already? Yeah. Did you tell them the Yankee Candle story? No. Okay. Well, okay. Can I tell I, them it? Reader's Digest. Reader's Digest. Um, Getty Images, some Czechoslovakian artist copied an image by our artist, mm -hmm. ended up Yankee Candle bought it, didn't have their legal team go through it, and they sold over, in four months, about a couple million of these candles on various, you know, vote teams, whatever. I was able to acquire an attorney to then sue them, basically, mm -hmm. and we settled out of court, but they sold, I don't know, like 3.7 3. million. 3. 7 right. million candles mm -hmm. taking this image right how does one avoid that through yeah. what we're trying to achieve with you 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 guys are asking good questions okay so there's a service I trained them well <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, there's a service that will do image matching okay and so uh, in the photography industry uh, if somebody uh, is agent for a photographer uh, what happens is you're able to um, scan the internet because every picture has what's called a hash and that hash is, is like a fingerprint. And so uh, they scan through trillions and trillions of images looking for your image. Okay. And when they find it, then they let you know that we found uh, an abuser an encroacher. They're on, they're on your image. And then, um, they're responsible for working backward to find out, uh, you know, this is on this particular site and then they'll do the work for a fee of, of policing all of that and, um, and bringing it down. Now they find that, uh, and you're notified every time they find it. So that's the easiest way because that's really specialized software. And uh, there's two companies that do it really well, and there's a bunch of posers that do it half-ass. Yeah. But, but when that's working, you get an, it's an early warning system, right? It's like um, you're, you're, you've got a canary in the coal mine, and you're too young for that expression too. So uh, coal miners would take their canaries down in the mine, and when the canary stops singing, uh, 
um, it, there was toxic gas down in the mine. So they ran like hell when the bird quit singing. So th- it's your early warning system. And technically, the bird was belly up at that point. <laughs> uh, yes. I, I didn't like to mention that, but yes, you're right, Tom. Yeah, well, and they, with a high respiration rate, they died pretty quick. But if they went quiet, they were checking their bird. Right. <laughs> so, so what happens with that, Lisa, is that once the, they actually pull the site down, so they shut that site down temporarily until they comply. Is that right, Robert? No, no, not necessarily, okay? If you have provenance, okay, so if you have provenance and you file it with Google and whatever, at that point, as soon as you discover you have an encroacher, then you say, this is my provenance. These guys are copyright infringers or, or you know, this is, not their, this is not their work. Then they will delist them. But you, you need to have your provenance. Which is so, easy because you've got which that. Is, so. Right. Yeah. So the, the nice thing about that is that, uh, as soon as this project starts, we take all the provenance, we give uh, Google the high resolution uh, images, do it in advance, so then it's that fast because it's all on file. That as soon as it's discovered that somebody's put it on candles or they put it on mugs or something, and now they're selling a bunch of these mugs, uh, the, the image, they have to show the image in order to sell it. So the the algorithm is going to find it and detect it. Now, if they modify it a lot, then that will disrupt it. Uh, but then they've modified it a lot, so it's it's able to tell. Like we have the image, and they went ahead and they uh, rounded the image instead of it being square. It'll still work. It'll still figure out that that's the image. It's, it's gotten pretty sophisticated, and that's why I say two companies are good at it, and the, and the other ones that do it, they they suck. They charge you the same money, but they suck. Very interesting. Yeah. And that's what my 40 years brings to you guys. You know, it's like I've had about 400 clients, a little less than, over those years, and this is the beautiful thing about what's happened in my life. I started off so young at it that the C-level executives would tell me what their worst nightmare was and their best solution to fix the nightmare. And then they paid me to do the in-between part. They knew they needed a computer to do it. They just didn't know how to get that part done. So it's a, it's a quadruple PhD in business problem solving which is a whole lot different than the academic way of looking at a business. This is real life fixes. Is, if you have another question. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> my other question, Robert, is if we're going to be targeting sales internationally and hoping to acquire people who have the means with which to buy these images, mm-hmm. um, how, my, what I'm trying to get at is how do we, I know that you mentioned having videos or having informational pieces on there that could better inform them Mm -hmm. as to what it is that they're looking to buy. Mm -hmm. But how do we, let's say they take an interest and then they go silent. What is the strategy to try to, you know, you you invest, how do you reenact or bring them back into play? Um, Okay. so, So that they, you know, maybe are not lost. Right. Okay. So one of the one of the seven businesses that I'm doing is called FunnelBuilders.org. Okay, and it's it's getting ready to launch. And what FunnelBuilders.org is is that um, a sales funnel is a series of actions, predictable actions, and of engagement, of of um, of uh, identification hitting their hot buttons, reaching out and communicating with them, re-engaging them, and, and it's all automated. So a proper sales funnel is a lot different than a, a sales funnel. A, 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 I, it's my contention that all websites will be gone within 10 years. Really? Okay. Oh, yeah, because a website does nothing for you. A website is a brochure. Thanks a lot. I just redid my website. Okay. Well... <laughs> 
<laughs> Good thing you know an excellent funnel builder. <laughs> you can get the jump on your competition. So uh, look, if you have the best salesperson in the world, do they always follow up all the time correctly? Do no, they, they always? Don't. That's, yeah, there are a lot of missed opportunities. Right. And do they always say the right things? Well, no. When you film the right thing and you deliver it at the right time for the right reason, always on schedule, always tuned to make the potential client vibrate, right? Um, and so that in itself is a science, and you've got a you've got a linguist. So being able to do that and write those scripts and then have them pr produce as videos. Uh, is a great way to do that. And um, I've even got a setup, which is, is pretty cool. And here's the way it works. <laughs> so I make a video in English, okay? And then imagine a spreadsheet where you've got a column going down. And it says at 10 seconds, the caption needs to read, so he got on his horse. And at 21 seconds, it goes and rode off into the sunset and at uh, 55 seconds, and then he got shot, okay, so now, <laughs> or whatever. And so now uh, I give it to a, um, a native speaker in China, or I have a red-headed Irishman that's 70 years old that speaks fluent Cantonese and, and Mandarin here in Las Vegas. <laughs> I got a weird circle of friends. What can I say? So, um, <laughs> exactly. And so, um, yeah, and he's six two. It's like the craziest thing when we go to a restaurant. They get so confused. He's possessed. <laughs> <laughs> Mama hoo hoo. <laughs> so, um, so then I, I have the native speaker go down the second row and they read what's here at, at uh, 10 seconds in, and he got on a horse, and they say, and down here at 15 seconds, they say, and down here, they say something else, and then in Danish, somebody's doing it, and in Japanese, somebody's doing it, so the subtitles are in all these languages, even though the high production value of the video doesn't have to be redone with audio. It could be done with audio, but it's just an unnecessary expense. Because English and Spanish are the language of the world, so, um, and of course, Chinese. But it's okay, yeah. you won't need to learn Chinese because I'll all know English in another 10 years. <laughs> oh, it, Chinese is super easy. You just do that for a little while, and they just figure you from some other, uh, some other province and they don't understand you. <laughs> Our, our 15 year old has had five years of Mandarin and she oh. just started in high school. That's awesome. Phoenix. <laughs> oh, God, that's awesome. That is so cool. I probably would fool him, too. <laughs> or her. Him or her. Voiceovers. We'll have Sydney do voiceovers for you. Oh, see, there you go. So, yeah, the various pieces of technology are all there. It's just a matter of uh, what's the best way to do it. Make some initial money right away and then take it up to a whole new level. I think one thing I could see with this, just being in the art business and working in galleries and, and different levels, is that you know the visual appeal will be the first, but in terms of the sales tax, task all along, is like you say, having the information on the artist and the artist speaking about himself, then that's the romancing because they're falling in love with the artist as well as the art. Mm -hmm. well, that's why you have art shows. I mean, that's the right. purpose of an art show. <laughs> Exactly. Here is now it's a digital art show. You're doing right. interviews with the artist. You might have we might film Andre fil painting a picture, and you do a time lapse photography, and then you then you speed it up, and you can show the whole picture coming to life. Mm -hmm. and so you make it really interesting and dynamic, so that the people you know looking at the site get really involved, rather than just looking at something that's you know just a typical website where it's static. But it's the follow-up that, you know, it's the, you were looking at this, hi, Joe, you were looking at this picture a week ago, we thought we'd send you some more information, or here's something else that you might want to look at, or here's another piece that you might want to consider, so that 
the, the, the funnel completely re is targeting them completely. Well, it, re it reiterates and it's the close, basically, because let's exactly. look at, at when you look at Facebook and people post things and you read something and then you read it again and then you share it with people. You know, it's it's that same sort of uh, relationship, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah no, and that's exactly right. And the, look, you can uh, you can get a hell of a camera that has every trick known to man for $450. You can get a hell of a camera that has all but six of the, every trick known to man for $200, okay? And produces an amazing image and time lapse, like uh, Michael said, is nothing. You just bolt that sucker down solid, put it, put it on its own power supply and let it click away for months, okay? Uh, and uh, so, it's things like that. If you embrace the, the digital divide here, there are going to be those people that do it the old way and they'll die, uh, wither away on the vine. And the ones that get in early and do it fast and right are, are just always going to be, have the money to always maintain doing it fast and right. So it's the early adopters. You know, 10 years ago, it was a little more dicey, okay? Uh, I made a 360 degree lens in the software to film everything in every direction all the time. It cost me a lot of money. And I thought, oh my God, this is great. And nobody will ever watch a movie the same way ever again, because you'd be able to spin around and uh, see 140 degrees at a time. You hear a shot and you'd spin around and rewind it and, and see if you could see the butler sneaking out of the room or whatever. And you could never, ever watch a movie the same way twice, but twice, but I was too ahead of my time. But it was fun. That's why I went to India and I filmed all of the temples in India in 360. And I ran around for three years in a Class A motorhome uh, filming giant sloths in North Carolina and, and <laughs> Miami Beach, South Beach. <laughs> it was like, yeah, hey, let's go somewhere else. <laughs> I didn't know they had slots in Miami. Beach. I thought they were from uh, Wisconsin. No, that 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 was that was in uh, North Carolina. Giant three-toed sloths. I, stu I stood next to one. <laughs> what uh, is there? Toes. Is there any way to get some gauge of what our competition in the art business right now would be doing this? Oh if my God! Another great question. Yes. Now, the services that I, I contract out to, uh, that, um, that if you know the names of those competitors, what I'm able to do is give them a bit of a map, and then when they fill in the map, what I'll know is every site they advertise on, when they started, how often they're running the ad, what their ad budget is, what uh, when they ended or switched what they were running for something else? Okay. See, in funnelbuilders.org, I, 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 when you see my picture on the internet, it's like I'm with some of the top people in the internet, Russell Bronson and, and uh, Todd Brown and, and some of the really um, high-tech people. And so I'm going to go hang out with, uh, Todd down in Fort Lauderdale next month and with Russell in, in Los Angeles uh, next couple of weeks from now. Um, but, uh, and then funnel launches, uh, product launches. So uh, with a product launch, what you normally do, because the strategy here is going to take a, um, some explaining to the people in this country that you're going to be doing this in a different way now. Okay. So, Traditionally, you would try and search out galleries and talk, reach out to the gallery owner and talk to them about stocking a certain amount of product and da 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 da, probably. Um, and so, if it's going to be done differently, then that has to be handled in a product launch. In a product launch, you've seen them, they do uh, video number one and they wait six days, and they do video number two and they wait four days, and they do video number three, and then uh, five days later, they do the open cart and then they sell something. Okay, so there's a whole system to that. And I've been uh, working with, uh, uh, you know, some of the top salespeople 
uh, in, in that industry too and had their products for three years. So being able to do product launches uh, is, uh, is, is awesome. Okay. Because it's, there's a whole science to it. it. It's, it's very predictable. You can, you can do a product launch and know it's going to work, especially Okay, and here's, here's the kicker, because you guys have been in business. The, uh, if you know that the money that you're gonna spend on advertising, you're gonna spend a dollar and you're gonna get a dollar 10 back, you'll spend a million dollars because you'll get a million, a hundred thousand dollars back. Okay, it's, it's like, who cares? Okay, as long as you're building your list, as long as you're reaching out to the, to the base, and as long as you're breaking even. Now, a lot of the big guys don't even care about breaking even because they know they're going to get them in the, uh, on the second offer. So they'll lose money just to locate the customer. So that's the other thing that we need to do in a bigger, longer, more detailed session is, is like, okay, so how fast do you want this to go? Do you want the, this to be explosive? Do you want to tr kind of trickle your way in? Do you want to do one country first and then two months later do the next country and da, 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 and roll out a launch for each one of them? Um, you know, what's the pre-launch stuff? How are you seeding it? What do you, what do you want to spend on researching what your competitors are doing to just reverse hack everything that they do? Because, you know, in the old days, what we would do is if you saw an ad running in the back of a tabloid magazine or in the back of popular science or something, popular mechanics, and that same ad ran week after week or month after month for a year or more, you know that was profitable. Mm -hmm. You know what they were doing. They did the market research for you. You just hack that, that ad and you reverse engineer it and you do it a little bit better. You run it in the same place as they run it, and all of a sudden, there you are, is like white on rice, and you're all over them, and they're wondering, how the hell are they doing this? <laughs> is less more or more less? Like, if you have so many artists featured, is that, like, too much? Or if you have fewer artists and less options, are you more likely to succeed? Well, if you, this is the beautiful thing about the flypaper. Okay, because if you know, if you've got um, a, a demographic that you know is likely to get this artist, then you're flypapering that artist. The, 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 the people that you're assuming are the kind of people. So you flypaper sites where they're doing, um, you know, let's say you've got a piece of art and it's kind of sporty. Right, and so you're flypapering people that are going to uh, uh, reviews or shootouts between an Audi uh, R8 and a Nissan, uh, you know, top of the line, you know, sports car. And so now you know that 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 particular piece of art is going to be applicable for that person. And so you put the puppy on the leash and you walk it in front of that person. So it's it's no longer generalized demographics that's a beautiful thing about this this is why i'm not taking on anything but uh but partners now it's like jesus nobody else does this stuff so um you know and that's that's the long answer to a simple question it's like because you're able to get so specific on the people that you're uh, able to figure out i know the person that wants this piece of art is going to be living in the snow belt because it's a snow scene. Um, and it, 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 having a tropical beach in Minnesota might not be the best piece of art to show that person. So that's why you kind of map out a mini strategy, maybe down to the piece of art level. And once the money starts to come in from this, being able to have a team of four, of four or five people that's doing nothing but doing that research and, and uh, uh, figuring out who they are demographically and tuning this whole thing per piece of art, golden. You know, it the could, other, the it other, couldn't get any more efficient. The other thing that's really what in, is it very interesting, Tom and Lisa, is the ability to, you know, once you've got, a, once you've got somebody on the hook and they buy a piece, you can now upsell them 
you know, which often doesn't happen in the gallery. You know, they'll sell one piece and they'll just stop because they're so excited about having sold one piece. But the system can say, okay, congratulations on your purchase. By the way, we want to show you something else that we think you might like and you might take them to a different artist or you might show them another piece and, you know, just build multiple sales. And so the ability to do all of that and, and have a, a really efficient sales channel is going to be, you know, Oh, it, get, it, it gets even wackier than that. Now watch this one because I'm, uh, I created two nonprofits and I support two other ones that are not mine. But um, what uh, I wanted to be able to do is get everybody that became a subscriber, I wanted them to become an evangelist. Okay, so I, I am going to change America because America is the last holdout for going over to metric measurement. And I think it's insane and it's hurting our kids badly. Okay. Um, 194 countries and only American kids don't know metric. It's insane. Okay. So I'm going to change that using social. So what I wanted to do is reach out to the kids and the kids would pay 10 bucks to become like the Mickey Mouse club of metric. And so uh, then they're going to get paid two dollars for everybody that they bring into their circle so they're going to actually be able to make money by being in the club okay that ten dollars will come back every time they invite somebody so in your case uh being able to sell a piece whether uh the person is going to buy the next piece themselves or wants to buy the next piece themselves if you were to offer them a 20 percent commission finders fee for any of the people that they know that they would personally recommend and we give them a link and they send it to their friend and their friend buys that is all automated yeah. I can I can put that whole thing together as well and now what every customer is is your own personal evangelist that it turns into an art broker as well as an art uh, you know, person that appreciates the art that they already own, which gives them the money then to buy it, their next piece. So it's an upward spiral, isn't it? Or you yeah. can give them a credit, you know, credit towards their, their next purchase, you know. Mm -hmm. so five, five of your friends buy a piece and the next piece is on us. Something like that. Right. So you all know, of... Here's a, let me just tell a story, Tom. Um, I have this company that make, manufactures conveyors in California. And I, so I put in a system, for, built a file maker system to automate their whole business. And literally the day it went live, they went from three and a half people doing sales, quoting and order processing to one person. And their business went from $1.2 million a year to $3.6 million, which was pretty amazing. But the second step was to, to do the follow-ups because their marketing lady would spend two days a week just doing follow-up, calling people who put in a request for a quote and seeing if they were going to buy. So we automated the whole process so that they just set a schedule and the, every, if they hadn't heard from the client after 10 days, it sent out a personalized email with a copy of the quote to that person just saying, you know, we just wanted to make sure that you got it and see if you're still interested in everything. And then they, it sent out two more emails before they basically said, this is a dead deal. Do you know what percentage of sales resulted from those emails without anybody picking up the phone or doing anything? Right. No idea. 35%. That's good. With no, with no interaction. No interaction at all. It right. Takes, it takes the lady five minutes on Monday and five minutes on Friday, and she literally... And it takes her that long because she it literally pulls up a list of all the people on the screen and she just goes through it and says, I don't want to send that one. So she admits that one and then it's done. And that's all she does. Mm. And the orders keep coming in. So this will make a huge difference to, to your business because it's that follow-up. It's like, we didn't forget you. Here's the picture you're interested in. Have another look. Click on it. Bang, bang. Right. So in, in the business... Oh, I've got a, another appointment coming up. Um, so in the business, uh, it's called upsells, side sells, or downsells. Okay. okay. 
And so uh, being able to automate all of that is just very straightforward, okay? It's not easy, but it's straightforward. So as long as that path is mapped out um, in a proper sales funnel uh, method, what happens is you give them a certain amount of breathing room. You send, I can even get it to the point where it automatically uh, sends thank you postcards to them, okay? Who gets a postcard anymore, okay? Every time you sell something, it can be automatic if you wanted it to. Um, and so, um, and then if they buy a piece and then they buy a, another piece, it'll migrate them from a list where they were a prospect for the first one to a list that they're a purchaser to another list that they're, they purchased two pieces. So they're a serious collector and all this migration stuff can be done with a set of rules that are called if then, then that I F T T T. So when you do if then, then that, then, um, then all of that clerical crap, that kills businesses is now automatically handled. But that's where the experience that, um, you know, spending a day or two together and just mapping out what you know about galleries and the potential customers and the kind of things that I know about the internet and the tools and mapping that whole thing together, um, you know, starting out with a version one that makes you money then, uh, then being able to step up to create the version two and then, you know, making a lot more money. And then version three is like, oh, my God, who the hell are these people and how did they move from unknown in the Internet to being the Goliath? That's pretty much it. When, when you said that you felt like websites are going to be obsolete. Mm hmm. So what is going to be taking over? Just marketing, mass marketing? SC? No, no. Uh, a website is really nothing more than a brochure. Yeah. Really, it, it's dead. It, it's just a different way of displaying without printing anything. It Correct. has a bigger reach than a single brochure. You create it once and you've just got a brochure that anybody can read. Okay, but that doesn't do any follow-up. So... Uh, it, it doesn't do any uh, emotional connection, okay? It, it, people don't read. So a proper sales funnel is what's going to replace uh, uh, websites. So they enter into the same URL. They're confronted with somebody that is explaining certain things to them. If maybe they're making conveyors, uh, and uh, doing a tour of the factory, and then all of a sudden, all these other steps, all the follow-up, all the, immediately before they even finish watching the video, an email has already gone to them uh, with contact information, whatever. And if if they don't follow up, then they're going to get another one a day and a half later. And all of that automation is what's going to be replacing websites. They'll kind of look like website, but underneath it all is a huge engine which I call the proper sales funnel and the proper sales funnel is uh, is the most dynamic salesperson you could ever have that takes the best of your various salespeople and the best of the techniques and reduces it to being delivered on time for the right reason with the right anchors the right language the right uh, timing and just does it completely 100% consistently, and a website doesn't do any of that, does it? Mm -hmm. So the sales funnel basically takes over the sales process and automates it for, for, the, uh, for the prospects and for the actual owner of the website. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, in, in, and even uh, being able to send surveys to people, okay? A survey with uh, three different pieces of art. Now this is this is really clever, okay? Because when you uh, survey people, people love to make to give you their opinion. So I could see in your business being able to set up a survey page where there's three images, and you say which do you which of these appeals to you the most? Well, what's happening here? They answer the question. They've just self-identified what they're going to buy next. Mm -hmm. mm, I like that. 
right? And then when they answer that one, three more pictures come up and they answer that and then three more pictures come up and now you've got a complete psychogra psychographic, complete psychographic profile. It doesn't mm -hmm. get any, it doesn't get any more clean than that. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like when we were selling David Lemon, Tom, you know, in the pre-publication, we knew these people loved David Lemon and all we did was send them a picture of the clay. We, in the early days, we'd sell the entire edition before even print cost one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Those were the good old days. Well, and so you know, watch. There's, there's also Sorry, Michael. You couldn't do limited shock. It wasn't available. You broke up there, Mike. Say it again. So there's no reason you couldn't even, you know, at some point you might say, okay, well, we're going to do, Andre's going to do an edition that's only going to be available in China. So only Chinese buyers can, can get it. And then you, you're offering an exclusive to Chinese buyers. You could do that if you wanted to. Um, you know, there's so much you can do, but, you know, the, the, the best part of it is just eliminating the inefficiencies and the laziness of salespeople who, are, who most of them, as you know, who aren't any good at it. Right. So uh, you both have a very good understanding of what it is that, you know, Thomas Charles Editions does. And the bulk of the business is not in selling original paintings, but in selling these original-like reproductions known as clays. Right. Um, my my um, my thinking on this is, you know, how how do we position ourselves to be any different than anyone else mm. in this space? And and that's what I'm trying to figure out by better understanding your funnel engine and and this whole sales process. But how are we going to be better than anyone else who's selling this type of artwork? Uh, real simple. It's so simple. Um, a car is nothing more than a seat that moves you down the road at 84 miles an hour. Right. If you're going to go a little over the limit. Okay. okay. Now, if I do it in a Yugo, to get up to 84 miles an hour is going to take me 15 minutes. <laughs> if I do it in a Testarossa, I'm going to do it in 3.2 seconds. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's, look, you, you can't stop the, well, you, you, you can minimize the people that are ripping off your, your talent, okay, by using some software. You can um, and collect penalties, and that'll be a wash, because they're going to do it, and you're going to collect penalties from them, and, and so that service will essentially be free. The other people don't know about it. Uh, if, you are, if you get to market faster, then you're, you're dominant. And if, if, you know, you take a look at Thomas Kincaid, it had all those galleries all over the place. Every mall you went into, there was his damn gallery. And it was like, I, I looked at his art and I thought. <laughs> Same with Tom. We could have invested in him early on. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of people liked him. I, I just didn't like him. And so, um, it, so if you can take somebody new and you can turn them into the next Kincaid, okay, because you're able to deliver him to a zillion places at once without having physical galleries and malls and all the overhead and people sitting around twiddling their thumbs waiting for the next person to come in and they're tired of being there so they don't even, you know, get up away from their coffee to go talk to them. I said, that's the old way of doing it. That's like, if people are going to do that, you know, and I almost got into the business, like I said, but the guy liked his little bottle and, um, <laughs> but right. And, and so, but those were with the Epson printers and they did a really respectable job and you guys use the Canon printers. So being able to have a Canon print in, in Japan, uh, set up in, in a small 500 square foot room and just printing them there in Japan, uh, because you're selling so many of them might be the way to go instead of worrying about duty shit just do it in the in the country same with china just get a 500 square foot room or a thousand square foot room 
and big old rolls of canvas and a bunch of cartridges and start banging them out. And, you know, you don't worry about the duty if that's in your way. That's the worst thing that could happen. It's like, okay, so we put a printer in the country. Yeah, but the difficulty is the artist has got to sign a number them, Robert. So that's, you've got oh. to. Oh, okay. I, I mean, you, it's possible, you know, if, it, if the market was big enough, you could do that. And you then, you know, you, you take a trip and you take the artist with you and he spends a week signing. Oh, signing. yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's and me, it, that, in that case, okay, that's called the pre-sale model. So it, it's a product launch. So the, the, the artist is going to be coming to Japan or coming to China. He's going to be signing uh, and numbering each of the prints. Uh, and uh, you're going to be able to meet him or her. And so you make an event out of it, just the way the Japanese are doing in their malls. So you take their beautifully working model and you duplicate it in the other countries where they're not. Or maybe you'll hire one of the Japanese to do it. They already know, you know, the ropes. Let them do it. Good idea. Yeah, no, that's... Uh... And obviously, Michael, you understand the nature of the business too, because the personalization piece of enhancing the uh, the painting and even taking requests from time to time, which we have been known to do at galleries, to personalize the piece is what makes the sale. It does, but you know, it's also a matter of it does make the sale, but it re also requires an extra level of work, and you've got to have the artist in the gallery, and you've got to be able to sell that as a it's an advantage, and you and I know that it's not much of a bill. It's not a real big deal for the artist to do that, but it's a, still a sales process. And you know, is it worth is it worth doing? Maybe if you're doing gallery sales, but if you can just sell the chiclet as a signed and numbered piece and get your get your decent price and not pay the gallery fifty, not let the gallery make fifty percent on the you know on the cost of it. So you make a hundred percent, and then you you know, you pay a commission or whatever it is exactly. you know, for that. So you're just better off because it's all about volume. You know, if you yeah. can sell the entire editions out without ever getting on a plane or having to make a physical trip somewhere and all the expense and the stress of putting on live shows, which are a lot of work, and Tom's been doing that for so many years, and, it's, <laughs> you know, it's hard. When you go on the road, it's hard. It takes a toll on you. That's no question about that at all. So yeah. So the value of what we particularly own as a company here on our end is that we have the rights or we possess the ability uh, to get a hold of these images because we either own them or we have the rights to them. And therefore, we can uh, reproduce them in numbered series and limited editions. The thing is, I'm trying to, in my mind, understand how this will affect pricing too. And I'd like to have this problem because making more sales would be awesome and avoiding the middleman who eats, you know, 60% of the price of the, uh, the commodity would be wonderful. But you work so hard to get the price to where you want it to be. Um, I'm wondering how this would affect us also from a pricing standpoint. And that's more for us to talk oh, about. But you don't. You only do 100 in each country. You've just added five countries, and you've done a limited uh, run. Yeah. And you, you, that would be wonderful. You, I'd love to sell out that limited run. Right. So you, you create scarcity. No, and, that would be, see, that was my question. I would like to create scarcity. Of course. And not just create more volume. Right. So you say, you know, this, this series is only for Japan, and we're only doing 50. Now that you've got scarcity and you've got urgency. Okay, that's exactly the point. Yeah, because we have what was what are called domestic and international editions too, mm -hmm. and and that would be that would be a very good marketing uh, strategy, I think. Oh yeah. yeah, sure. I mean, it it always works because you put a countdown timer on on the proper sales funnel, and it, and it says you know on this date, you know fourteen days from now. Uh, these are going to be released. There are only 50 and, or there's only 25 and, uh, you know, there you go. It's a free publication release. You know, on, you can buy this now. It's a very small limitation for $2,200. And on the end, you know, the first 50 will be sold at that price and then it'll go up to $3,000 mm -hmm. or it'll go up to $3,000 on such and such a date. Right. Now. 
snooze, you lose. Right. right. And so you, you've got the urgency, you've got the exclusivity, you've got all of that other stuff. And then you throw in something extra for the early adopters. Uh, like, uh, well, I don't know, you'll have to figure out some kind of an ethical bribe that somebody would like, but you know the business better than I, and, and you come up with something. And even if it's like, you know, an iPad loaded with uh, images of everything that he's got, you know, something, you know, for the first 50, whatever, you know, maybe it's not images, or maybe it's uh, um once a month, the artist will get on and you're invited to listen to him talk about his craft for a half an hour. And we do, we do a live stream right from his house. Well, and those while can he's be, painting. Yeah, and those can be archived, like you said, and they can, can become part of a collection that anyone oh, can that, access at any time. Yeah. yeah. W with, with the uh, Tibetan situation, they've got 600 kids and they haven't been filming the kids. And so I said, that's got to change, okay? You need to be uh, filming the kids each year. You've got to do a little two or three minute interview. And I, I said, do you realize what's going to happen? Because now these kids are going off to universities and a lot of them are getting free rides, but th they continue to support them uh, by covering their uh, living expenses, even though they won a full scholarship. And they've been getting into some pretty snazzy schools so they've done an amazing job and these kids are so well balanced that the Chinese government is sending their educators to Tadra to find out how they're doing this how you can take orphans from you know these kids I've got video I've got a terabyte and a half of video where they're living in 25 below weather and they literally are um, behind a flapping wall of, of fabric made out of yak hair. That's their protection from the elements. Mm -hmm. And you can see the corners are open and you can see underneath it and they don't have wood. They're at 12,000 feet. There's no wood. Okay. They, 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 they've got, they heat the, uh, and cook on yak poop. Sure. You know, and that's where these kids came from. And now they're leaving this program scholars. It's awesome. Yeah. So whenever you tell a story, proper storytelling is what is going to make this thing work. Okay. Mm -hmm. and proper introductions, being able to sit down with, with the artist and, and have him or her go through what you, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I, I think that stories with strategic intent are invaluable because people can relate to the stories and then they actually, um, want to buy at that point. Uh, could you tell us, I know that you had another meeting coming up, but could you tell yeah. us very quickly out of the models that you're currently uh, using now, that funnel model that you talked about and then automating that sales process, what businesses are you currently involved in where that's working? Because you said you had already partnered with some people. Yeah, so um, the, uh, the business that uh, is selling the rugs is one. Yes, uh, I, I remember I, that and, one, yeah. And, and the rest of them are my companies. For instance, I'm, uh, uh, Carlos Slim uh, it, it was a, a monopoly in Mexico in telecommunications. He had to stop being a monopoly. And, um, and so now he's got 48% of telecommunications in Mexico, which made for an opportunity to sell SIM cards at 20 and 30% cheaper than anybody else can sell them for. So now, uh, okay. next month, uh, you can go take a look. Well, go take a look at uh, a, a couple of funnels I just put up. Uh, go take a look at the Saving NH, Saving New Hampshire, and Saving Philly. Okay. I, I just, and, and those are just really rudimentary. Uh, they're introductory ones. I did uh, uh, Saving Philly in Spanish. Okay. But then five minutes later, she says, well, hey, it's just in Spanish. I said, yeah, because we're going after the Spanish market to invade Mexico. And she says, well, what about the people that don't speak Spanish very well? I said, all right, hang on. Five minutes later, I text her. I said, now it's in Danish. It's in uh, German. It's in French. It's in Chinese. It's in Japanese. And, and that was five minutes later. Amazing. Yeah. 
But I, I definitely have to go, you guys. I, I'm, I'm, I, you can hear the dinging going on. They're going, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? So, um, so is there any way we can continue this a little bit with Michael, or do you want to just all get back together uh, whenever it's convenient for you? Why, why don't I put together a preliminary proposal? I, I was just out uh, in New Hampshire, uh, and uh, that was a, a three-day consultation. It was $10,000, and that was just for talking and mapping it all out and making the whole strategy, okay? Um, and but that was not as a partnership that was strictly a consultation if you guys want a partner and what i'll do is i'll send you a little uh, uh proposal that says how i think this can work we know that there's plenty of margin in it uh one of the smartest people i ever met in finance said never be intrusive to the deal okay and so i'm not uh, I, I know that you've got a lot of work to do on your end. You know that I've got work to do on my end, and it's all high-end work to make this thing happen. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's totally worth doing. You become an early adopter, and you can crush it before anybody realizes what the hell just happened to them. What, what is the time frame on getting a project like this? You know, accelerated, I guess. Yeah, it's pretty fast because you already have the images, you already have the descriptions, you have all the pieces on your end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, being able to do the flypaper is going to take time. The flypaper is going to take about three weeks of some concentrated effort to uh, get that established. Uh, the uh, proper sales funnel is three weeks uh, probably as well. And these things can be done phased in, okay? So by about the time you're figuring out what your duty situation in each of the countries is, uh, then, you know, we're just going to start phasing it in. Well, I, I think, Robert, you would do a beta of some kind with one country that you maybe want to target initially. I don't yeah. think that we necessarily go after a multiple Sorry. number of countries. We want to beta it, I think, with at least one. Yeah, so you know the, the ones that have the highest earners are, well, the three of them probably, India, Japan, and, and China, right? Uh, I, I, every so often I buy a Mercedes or, or uh, a Land Rover because they ship them off to China. Okay. I, I actually take possession of it for about uh, <laughs> seven hours, <laughs> and then they get shipped off. And I get three thousand dollars for having the fun of buying a car. <laughs> Good. So I'm a wheeler dealer. What can I say? I'm proud of it. Robert, if you exit this, uh, if you exit this meeting, can Tom and I and the others continue to chat? No. With, uh, yeah, I, I well. No, I think if you exit, you were the presenter and also the host. So I think if you yeah. leave, we all get disconnected. Right. But if you guys want to continue talking, uh, you know. Uh, you can just use Zoom. It's free for up to an hour at a time. I've got an account, so I can do this 24 hours a day for the next five years, as long as Don't I keep on Facebook. Do you want to Robert, are you on Skype? I am. It's just my full oh, name, okay. Robert Quasi. Okay, so I'll find you on Skype, and I'll send you an invitation for Skype. And Michael, you're on Skype as well, right? Yeah. Michael, How do I find you, Michael? On Michael underscore Rashad, R-O-C-H-A-R-D. So just Michael Rashard? Okay. Yeah, Michael underscore Rashard. Then, uh, underscore Rashard. Okay. And in what city again? Denver? Uh, yeah. Should be under Denver. Okay. And then yours is just found with your full name, right, Robert? Well, it's Robert Kwasny Skypes. Okay. Robert Kwasny Skypes. Thank no, you. No, no punctuation whatsoever. Okay. Why don't we just take a quick break uh, uh, over there, uh, Michael, and we'll call you on Skype. I'll send you an invitation in the next few minutes to both of you. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. Great. Okay. So thank you guys. It was a fun conversation. I, I hope to do lots of good business with you and we'll uh, start banking millions because of this. It's okay. uh, you've got the connections. I, I've got a certain amount of internet magic. Uh, Michael is a wizard. Uh, so it's all good. Okay. All right. Thank you all right. very much. Alan. Talk all right. again soon. Take care Bye -bye. guys. Bye. -bye. Thank you. <laughs>